All right, so um, I'm here to talk about vectors in search um, and how to try to embed vectors into your search engine um, without losing a lot of performance. Um, I am the chief data scientist at dice.com. Uh, I work on search recommendations and other uh, data science tasks. Um, I worked on our recommender systems, our job search, our talent search platform. Uh, I've also built our, I worked on our salary model and our career advisory pages. <clears throat> I'm a PhD candidate at DePaul. I'm studying machine learning and NLP. Um, and uh, hope, to, hope to graduate soon. OK, so the motivation for this talk is we're working on a next generation recommender platform. That's a, a semantic matching engine. Um, I can't talk too much about the details of that. Um, but you know, the requirement, so it needs to be a semantic matching engine. So it needs to understand the relationship between words, not just do you know, token matching. And we want to be able to scale it using our search engine, because that's our existing search infrastructure. Uh, the, um, the algorithms I'm talking about in this talk today, I have um, reference implementations in that GitHub repo there. Um, I will add a tutorial soon that will explain how to use them. But all of the code is, is there and live right now. Um, so you can kind of try it out and, and play with it yourself. OK, so I'm going to start with um, describing why, why we represent documents as vectors or, or images or, or whatever. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about how you learn vector representations. Um, but after that, I'm going to focus on how do we get vectors into an inverted index at scale, or some different approaches for doing it. It's far from a solved problem, but there's a lot of different ways you can think about that. So I'm trying to cover a kind of a broad set of, of ideas. <clears throat> so if you've um, ever worked with textual data, and I'm assuming most of you have, um, you'll face a number of key problems. Um, the main ones are that of synonymy and polysemy. You know, so synonymy is you have many words that mean the same thing, um, such as QA tester, um, quality assurance um, tester for us. Um, so we are, I should say, we are a job search site. So we, we are um, a IT focused uh, job site. So we're like career builder, um, but we just do tech jobs. Um, so we look at a lot of, of titles like Java developer, QA tester, and so on. Um, the other problem you'll face is polysemy. Um, so you have one word that has many different meanings. There's lots of other sort of related issues, such as hyponyms, hyponyms, um, different types of relationship that are maybe less important for a search engine, but you still probably want to understand them. Um, and also determining um, which words or phrases are important in a document is, is a key challenge. So how do we solve all these problems? Is there some kind of magic bullet? Um, well, I say yes and no. If we can map documents to, to kind of ideas or concepts, um, then theoretically, that will help solve a lot of these issues. Now, that, that's kind of hypothetical and, and a little um, loosey-goosey. Um, but what we're trying, really trying to get at here is some kind of representation, some kind of abstract, abstract representation um, of a document um, that kind of gets away from the keywords and gets at the semantic and the meaning behind it. <clears throat> so how are words typically represented? Um, so a, a kind of a simple way to represent a word as a vector. Um, so if you don't know what a vector is, and I had this conversation with someone yesterday, uh, a vector is a, a list of numbers. Um, that can use to represent something. Um, machine learning algorithms tend to work with vectors. Not all of them do, but a lot of them rely heavily on vector, vectors and matrices and, and linear algebra. <clears throat> um, so how do we naively represent a word in the vector? Well, a simple way is as a, what's called a one-hot vector, where you have a, a component. Each component of the vector um, represents a term in your vocabulary, and um, the word you're representing has a non-zero value, and the rest are zeros. And that's kind of how a search engine represents the data, except it ignores all the zeros. <clears throat> um, so there's some uh, challenges with that kind of representation. If you're trying to learn some kind of abstract representation of, of a word or a phrase, what you really want, if you want to get at the semantics of that word, is you want the representation of that word um, to be similar to other words that have similar meaning. If you have just a one-hot vector representation, 
the two words could be very different or they could be very similar. It doesn't matter, this, they'll still have a very different representation. A lot of work, a lot of talk um, early on in the deep learning kind of um, phase when it was becoming popular, they talk about distributed representations. So a distributed representation um, is like a dense vector instead of a, a, a sparse vector with a single non-zero. <clears throat> Um, and it's such that the components of the vector um, ideally represent some kind of learned concepts or, some, or um, latent um, space, latent ideas that are learned from the data. And, and really what you want is a dense vector where similar words have similar dense vectors, measured by some similarity um, metric. <clears throat> and this is called a distributed representation because rather than having a single value that's represented is really a kind of distribution of values across different columns or different components of the vector. <clears throat> so, sorry. Um, okay, so the next part of my talk, um, I talked a little bit about vectors. I want to talk about how we learn vectors and how do we learn these kind of um, distributed representations. Um, so, <clears throat> within computational linguistics and psychology and so on, um, this is sort of a long um, standing theory called distributional hypothesis. Um, most of you have probably heard about it. Um, it's really summed up in the, the famous quote by Firth. Um, where a word is characterized by the company it keeps. Um, so basically you look at the word, you look at the context it occurs in, in lots of different contexts, such as documents, and from that you kind of infer some notion of meaning or similarity. Now this is, this is quite an effective way to learn a kind of naive representation of semantics, um, but it also has some challenges. One thing is really a bag of words representation or a bag of words based model. So it, it ignores grammatical relations, relations, relations between words in the sentence, um, and ignores relative word order, more or less. There is a second, less well-known hypothesis called a latent relation hypothesis, um, which tries to get at those kind of things. I'm not gonna go into details on that, but I wanted to kind of bring your attention to it because it doesn't get much attention um, in literature. <clears throat> okay, so how do we um, learn meaning from context um, using a machine learning model? Well, the traditional approaches um, initially were latent models, like LDA and LSA, um, where they learn some kind of latent representation of a word or document. Um, more recently, um, there's been a lot of work on word embeddings or to back glove and so on. And then extending that to document embeddings. Where you, word embedding, you're trying to learn a uh, embedding for a word and a document for the entire document. Um, <clears throat> and then moving from that, word to vec was extended um, to be doc to vec and, and there was a few, a skip, there was skip forts and a few other kind of approaches. And it helps to really think about these, not in terms of the algorithms, but in terms of the context that they're learning over, because that's really what's more important. Um, so the topic models typically learn over uh, the context of a document. Um, <clears throat> word embeddings, they look at the a context window around the word. Um, and then the doc to vec looks at the combination of the document and, and the word window. Um, so that's word to vec, I won't spend any time on that. Um, there's some big limitations to these approaches, as some people have already talked about. Um, they don't really learn synonyms. I think what we really want is for them to learn true synonyms, and they don't. They learn um, this sort of notion of relate relatedness. Sorry. Um, so you can't really, they're not really true synonyms. They, they give you a good approximation of synonymy, but they don't, don't truly solve that problem. Um, they don't also solve polysemy that well, because you have, if you have a word that has multiple meanings, like bank, Right, so a bank can be a, an, a financial institution, or it could be like a small hill. 
um, that will have the same vector representation regardless of how it's been used in a sentence. So that's a big kind of limitation. Uh, in a naive way, using word to vec or, or whatever, um, you, you can't differentiate between those different word senses. You can't disambiguate the, the vector. So is that it? Well, very recently, within the last, I think it's about six months, um, researchers, three at least three different research institutions, published um, <coughs> some very similar results using deep language models. Um, so word to vec is a language model. A language model is basically a machine learning model that predicts the next word um, in a sentence given the previous words. Um, so word to vec is like a linear language model, but you can develop a deep language model using machine learning uh, and uh, deep neural networks. And what they can do is they can learn contextualized embeddings. So you can train such a model on your corpus, and then you can have it read a sentence, and you can have it adjust each word vector in that sentence to represent the meaning of the word in context, in its current context, not in its global context of all the documents, but in how it's currently being used. Um, I haven't heard anyone talk about that yet, so I wanted to kind of bring that up, because I think it's a really important piece of research. It's, it's pretty new. Um, there are three different models that were developed that I know of that, that try to do this. Um, Elmo, which is the most famous. Um, your ULM fit, and then there's the open AI transformer. These are both RNNs, and this is something completely different. But they're all, they're all language models. Um, this is what a recurrent language model looks like. Okay. All right, um, I'm gonna skip over these slides here. Um, there are different uh, approaches that people have used to, to embed these in search. Um, and I encourage you to re read some more about that. One of the, um, sorry. I don't really have uh, one of the more commonly cited papers I've seen is the dual embedding space model um, developed by Microsoft. And that seems to have a lot of promise for kind of scaling this stuff um, in a search engine. It, it, like a lot of things, it, it extends word to vec. Okay, so now I'll get to the sort of crux of the talk. How do we take these vectors that we've learned using these sophisticated um, context-based algorithms and how do we embed them in a search engine and how do we try to scale them? <clears throat> okay, so on the top here, um, this is what our <laughs> our uh, dense uh, embedding vector looks like. It's only got five components, so normally that's very small. You would have 50, 100, 300, um, but it couldn't fit on the slide, so. Um, it's just a list of um, real numbers. Um, they can be positive or negative. And then the bottom here, we have a, um, a snippet of a, a, an inverted index, or a simplified version. So an inverted index, you have terms, and then they map to a posting list, and a posting list is a list of document IDs. Um, now, the key thing to, to note here is that uh, the represent representation on top is, is dense. Like every element, every component in that vector is populated. In the inverted index, what you have is a very sparse representation, meaning you only list the documents that the term appears in, right? And, and you don't list all the other documents. Why, why should you? Right? And, and the reason why an inverted index is so fast is because of that sparsity. You know, there's no clever, really clever data structure like a B tree or something going on here. I mean, you may be using that you know, to do sorting and whatnot, but um, the event index is fast because of sparsity. If you have the same words in the same documents, in every document in your index, the inverted index is not fast, right? It's fast because of the properties of the words in your document being very sparse and very rare in general. Right, if you have some terms that are in almost every document that people search on, your search will be really slow. And we've actually had that issue. Um, the term Java, for instance, appears in almost any tech resume. So if someone searches Java on, on some of our search engines, um, it causes some, some problems. And we can't remove that as a stop word because it's something that people search on. Right, so 
I think most of you probably know most of that, um, but I just wanted to set the, the stage here. And really, the point is that, you know, inverted indexes work because of sparsity. So if you want to encode vectors in our search engine and we want to scale them, we need to also have a sparse representation. If we have a dense representation, then no matter how good that representation is, it's not going to perform well. Okay, so um, a very simple way to search using word embeddings um, is I actually covered um, about three years ago um, in the talk I gave here. Um, and all the code for that and the talk and the, uh, the video are in, in that GitHub repository. Um, but the basic idea is you want uh, word to vec on your documents and you, um, and you train it. You want to do some pre-processing, so you want to extract the common phrases and so on. Um, and then you can do that, you can use that in two ways. You can use that to do um, query time term expansion. Um, so here, user into Java developer. Um, we, we detect that as a named entity, as a phrase. Um, and then we <coughs> query word to vec and ask what are the most similar five phrases to Java developer. And then we inject those as kind of boosts in, all, in an all query onto the original query. So you still want to boost the first term the most, um, but, but then you can then boost the rest by similarity. That's a really simple way you can just quickly get word to vec into your uh, search engine. You don't have to do any re-indexing. You can do that in the API or, or even within um, some kind of uh, request handler in Solar. Uh, similarly, um, you can cluster those vectors using, say, k-means or, or some other clustering algorithm, and then take those clusters, turn them into tokens, and then embed those in the index, and uh, you know, search on those as, as a boost or a filter query. And so in a similar way, you can map Java developer to um, the top cluster, and then, um, and then boost by the, the similarity to the centroid. And what, what you might want to do there is you might want to run k-means multiple times with different um, sizes. And so you have different sort of granularities of clusters, and then the more, the higher k, the smaller the cluster, the more um, of a boost you give it. Um, do you have a question, ma'am? Yes, yes. Well, you, you really want to give preference to the original term. So the idea is that you're expanding the recall, but you don't want to impact the, the precision or the ranking too much um, in the top terms. So but you're really trying to bring additional documents to the bottom of the list. And it, it's, it's a phrase query, so the assumption is that anything that exactly matches that phrase will, will get ranked to the top. It's not doing a, um, a, you know, a unigram query or something. And I'm not, so I wasn't totally sure I understood. Yeah, the, these are just coming from word to vec, so they do la overlap some terms here, but they don't necessarily have to. And you, you would still have a more complicated query where you would match individual terms. But this is just trying to get the boosting and, and the ranking in a, in a good state. Um, but you would still have, you know, you, you still wouldn't just do a phrase query, you just still want to have documents that just match Java or just developer, potentially. Um, but that, that gives us an ordering here. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Mm -hmm. Like so, you was, like I said, you would still have it match those terms, but this is you're basically 
say I want to prefer the exact matches, then I'm going to use word to vec to help me sort out approximate matches. Yeah, and you, you wouldn't just have that. You would have some other you know, query terms there. But I, I can't show all that on the slide, so maybe I, we can talk afterwards if, if, you, if you need some more um, specifics. So sorry, I don't want to spend too long on this because um, I, I already talked about this quite a bit. Okay, um, so what we really want to do is we want to do nearest neighbor search on vectors. Um, so if you haven't heard of nearest neighbor, KNN um, is just an algorithm for saying, okay, here I, here I have some vector or some set of features. Give me the top K features. Very similar to a search engine. Um, you want to get the top K closest neighbors to your, your, your query. All right, um, so what we want to do if we're searching on vectors is we want to get the top K closest vectors. But ideally we want to use solar so we don't have to um, reinvent our infrastructure and we want to get all the advantages of solar. So if you do the naive approach um, is to just do a brute force search. And that scales lin lin linearly <coughs> in a number of components and a number of documents. That would normally be fine, but if you have millions of documents, it, it's pretty slow, or millions of vectors. Um, you inverted index. There wasn't actually, as far as I'm aware, um, you know, a, a, an exact big O notation for the performance of that because it depends on your data quite heavily. I have some details there as how you can kind of approximate that. Um, but basically, it's, it's generally better than uh, linear because of the sparsity quite by, by quite a bit. <clears throat> Skip that. Skip that. Um, so we could do a brute force nearest neighbor, but it's, it's probably going to be way too slow for your use case. So what we need is approximate nearest neighbor search. Um, this is like doing nearest neighbor, um, making it much faster, but then losing some of the accuracy of the algorithm as, as a kind of trade-off. Um, so in broad terms, the approaches can be either kind of data dependent, so you have some kind of model that learns off your data and adjusts itself specifically to your data. Um, sometimes that's a machine learning model, sometimes it's not. <clears throat> um, or it can be data independent, like a hashing algorithm. So it doesn't matter what your data is. Um, it doesn't adjust at all. It just kind of is deterministic. You have some input, it has some output. There are about, I don't know, hundreds of different ways to do this. Um, but I tried to kind of group them into four areas. Um, and really, um, two of those are actual algorithms that are very popular and a lot fall into this heuristic methods area. Right, so um, KD trees, which I'll get to in a second, um, you know, generally your first port of call if you need to do nearest neighbor search. LSH, which is very popular for doing Jacquard similarity, um, amongst other things. And then there's heuristic methods, which are more kind of data driven, data dependent. I'm gonna focus on the k-means tree, um, but there's a lot of other ones that are, like I said, there's, there's many in the literature that are probably worth exploring. And then the last one, th there's some approaches where people just manipulate the vectors in some way. It's, it's not model-based. It's kind of generally very simple um, to explain and understand. It can be effective. Um, and there's lots of different ways people have kind of played with vectors to try to encode them. So KD trees, um, KD trees are, can give you exact nearest neighbor search in um, sublinear time. However, the caveat is the number of components needs to be pretty small. I've heard the rule of thumb is about eight to 10. Um, the math I've seen quoted in the literature puts it at something like this, where n is the number of documents and d is the number of components. So you can see that it's exponential in the number of documents. So you need to have an awful lot of documents um, if you have a, even a small number of, um, of components for, to get any advantage of it. Below that threshold, it, it performs pretty lin linearly. I can't say that word. <clears throat> so you can do approximate nearest neighbor with a KD tree. Um, 
doing the exact nearest neighbor on vectors that are learned um, is not practical because they're typically 50, 100, 300, 500 components. And so it really doesn't work on those kind of scales. Right? It, it works really well, and it's used in the scene for doing spatial um, distance matching um, because you have only two or three coordinates. There is an approximate KD tree search, um, but according to the literature, that's typically outperformed by um, other approaches. It does okay, but it doesn't do great. Um, so the next big algorithm that you, you'll come across if you um, look into space is LSH, locality sensitive hashing. And um, the idea behind LSH is it's a hashing algorithm. So hashing algorithms typically you want to avoid hash collisions. Right? That's, that's kind of the idea. And LSH is kind of different. So actually, you want collisions, but you only want collisions between items that are similar. Um, and, you, and you only want to hash two things the same if they're similar. So that's where the, lo the locality preserving aspect comes in. It tries to preserve the, the approximate distance between items by hashing them into the same buckets. Um, the most common approach for this is using the um, min hash. Um, so most talks you'll see that talk about LSH talk about the minhash algorithm. LSH is really um, a whole family of algorithms that vary based on the, the hashing approach that's used. Um, but the minhash only is designed for Jakar's similarity. If we're trying to match vectors, what we need is um, a hash algorithm that, that works with cosine similarity or Euclidean distance, depending on what your similarity metric is. Um, so the way this is, is done with cosine similarity is, <clears throat> and this is kind of abstract, um, but there's a nice uh, diagram I'll show you in a second. So the idea is you generate um, a number of random vectors that are the same size as, as your vectors. And then for each of these random vectors, <coughs> they need to be unit length and Gaussian distributed. Um, you, multi you take your vector you want to encode and you do the dot product with that vector. And provided those vectors are uh, unit length, um, then, you can, then the dot product is the cosine similarity. And then you just take the sine of that dot product and, and, and use that to encode one bit of the hash function. So if, it, if dot product is greater than or equal to zero, you give it a one. If it's less than zero, you give it a, a, a zero or a minus one. And so this gives you a binary encoding for each random projection. You can control how many random vectors you want based on the length of the encoding. The more you have, the better it is, but also the slower um, it, it may be to search, um, or you may get, it may be too constrained. So let me, okay. So, um, oh, that's not showing up there. Let me get that over there. Okay, um, bear with me a second. Okay, so um, f there's a link to this paper in the slide. Um, this is the best explanation I've seen as to why this might work. Because you might be thinking, why, why did I have these random vectors? Why would that give me a, a representation that would work? So the idea is, is that each of those vectors is a separating hyperplane in your vector space. Um, here it's illustrated in two dimensions. So um, <clears throat> basically, each of these lines represents one random vector. Um, once you do this uh, dot product with that vector, you're basically partitioning the space um, along these lines. And your binary representation basically says, well, how many of these lines am I above or below? And if I'm in the exact same quadrant, then I'll have the same binary representation. If I'm in an adjacent quadrant, then I'll differ by, by one bit. And if I'm two over, then I'll differ by two bits. So you can see there that the binary encoding is on the top left, and you see the last bit is different for these two, um, these two vectors, because they just differ by that one um, that one random projection. 
what is one random vector that produces a different answer. So it's very weird, but that, this is the best explanation I've seen. Obviously, this is in two dimensions, so two components, but this generalizes to however many components in your vectors. Um, however, for real data, um, at least from what I've read, it, it is typically outperformed by more data-dependent approaches. So this is data-independent. It doesn't learn from your data at all. Um, it, it just kind of hashes your data. It doesn't matter what distribution those vectors fall in. It doesn't matter the, the shape of your vector space. The advantage of that is if you need to change your model or, or re-index your index, you don't have to change anything about the algorithm. So that's, that's a big advantage. But if it doesn't work very well, then there's not much point. Um, there we go. Okay, so um, how would you get this in, in a search engine if you wanted to, to do that? Um, <clears throat> So first you hash your, uh, your vector into some bits, um, as shown um, at the top there. And then you can code this in multiple ways. Now the more common way you do it is you take the entire binary coding and you treat that as a single hash bucket. And then you, you kind of tag that in your document. Um, that can work, but what you'll find with that and what I've found with that is that you, you get buckets where you either get tons and tons of documents or, or almost no documents. There's not much granularity there. Even if you really tune the, the number of bits you have and so on, either a ton of stuff will fall in there, in which case isn't, there's no point, or you'll, you'll get too few items in there for it to be useful. Another way to do it is you take each of those bits and you encode them as tokens using their position, and then you, you, you search against those tokens. And you can use the MM parameter to, to control how many of those you want to enforce a match on. At that point, though, you, you're not quite doing a brute force search, but you're doing something that's getting close to a, a brute force search. Um, so it, that could be much more accurate, but it doesn't give you a lot of performance gains. Another way is you could do shingles over that, um, which might work. I haven't tried that out. If you want to search that second method, um, I created a similarity class that just kind of ignores everything but whether two tokens match. It's also in the GitHub repo. Okay, so it, I kind of eliminated the first two methods. Um, it's not working. And then I went back and tested LSH and I found it didn't work too well. Um, so the next thing I came across was the k-means tree. Um, so this is a data-dependent approach. It's one of those kind of heuristic approaches. And what this is is, is basically applying k-means. So k-means is a clustering algorithm. You can tell k-means to do cosine distance when you cluster. So it preserves your similarity metric to some extent. And you can apply it recursively to your, your vectors. So you get this nice tree representation. Okay, so the idea is you, you basically cluster your vectors. So the branching you set a branching factor of B, which is the number of clusters for each iteration. You run it initially, that gives you your first level, and then you recursively apply k-means below that. And then you store the tree uh, in memory, and then each node of the tree is a centroid of the cluster. And you stop expanding the tree once you hit below the branching factor. You can then take that tree, and you can take the nodes of that tree, and you can give them unique numbers, and then you can code that in your index. So you can directly query against that tree if you want. So how this would work in Solar is you would maintain that tree in memory. You have your query, your vector comes in, your query gets converted to a vector, you find the closest matching leaf nodes to that vector. You take the cosine similarity to the centroids, and then you create a, um, a boost query. Mm -hmm. Kind of like this. That, that tries to match those, those leaf nodes in order of similarity. And then once you get the documents back, then you want to do a brute force re-rank of those documents using exact nearest neighbor, say the top of 1,000 or so on. And you probably want to do that with all these approaches. And you can use the, the re-rank query parser to do that. One nice thing about this approach is it gives you a lot of flexibility. So 
like I mentioned with LSH, it's kind of get all or nothing. You only get too many or too few documents. You can control a lot of things about the tree after it's constructed um, to trade off performance and accuracy. So you can search it at a higher level and then just search across the top level nodes. Um, you can, or you can search it really deep and then return lots and lots of leaf nodes. It gives you a lot of power in, in terms of how, how much or how hard you want to hit the index. Um, so some implementation details. So this is what your, your index might look like. You just have a bunch of tokens that represent tree nodes, and then you just want to use a kind of a simple similarity matching. So I, I, I use that same uh, similarity class. <clears throat> There's a number of other top heuristic methods. I'm not sure how to, if they can be easily implemented in a, uh, an inverted index. Um, so I'm not going to talk about them too much. So the final um, approach that I kind of came across that seemed popular is this kind of approach of taking the vector and kind of messing with it, and manipulating it, and um, removing a lot of the, the, the zero values. So if you take the vectors that we've learned on our data, I take all of the components and I plot them in a histogram. This is what it looks like. Okay, so what it tells me is the mean is around zero. So most of the elements are very close to zero. So if you do, do two dot products of two vectors and one of those components is zero, it's pretty much ignored because it has almost no impact on the overall seminality. So you can actually take these vectors, you can remove quite a lot of the components in them without really affecting the similarity score. So you can sparsify them um, to some extent that way before you start to lose much accuracy. So I, I kind of was looking into this and then I found some other people that had done the same thing. Um, one of those papers is linked above. So what this might look like is um, you take the top vector, you say I'm gonna take the top two elements or components in the vector um, by absolute value, so the furthest from zero, negative or positive, and I'm going to set everything else to zero. And then I need to find some way to encode those remaining components. One approach, which I don't think was great, but if, if it is referenced in that paper, is you just take that number, you, you truncate it to some low precision, like one decimal place, and then you code the position, um, the sign of the, the, the component, and then the value, round it up or down, uh, round it to the nearest value um, as a string, and then you search against that. That works a lot better than I thought, but it doesn't, I still don't think it works great. Another way to do that is um, that I was kind of experimenting with. So you can do the same thing, move all the zero elements. And then rather than throwing away the, the numbers here, essentially, um, because if you, if you encode it to one decimal place, right, but they don't match the numbers exactly, then you know, a 0.5 and a 0.6 are as different as 0.1 and 0.6. Um, so you lose a lot of the sort of value of the number if you, if you do that sort of naive encoding. What you can do instead is you can take just those components, encode them as, as just their position, and then store that with the payload of the value there. And you can do search using um, uh, some modifications to um, some of the code in Solar so you can recognize that as, say, the term frequency. Um, or as a boost, and at query time you can set those values as boosts, and then in the index those would be payloads. And uh, Solar 6 can handle negative boosts, um, so actually still that works with negative numbers too. Um, so I did, yeah, about a minute, I did some um, experimentation and I have some initial results. Um, using my MacBook Pro, um, what, using one index, 700,000 documents, so I can actually test this stuff reason, in a reasonable amount of time. I compared the performance of these different approaches with how fast they run and, and also how many of the top 10 documents they return compared to exact brute force search. So what's nice about this kind of approximate nearest neighbor is you don't need any labels. You, your golden standard is exact search. That's costly to compute, but you can compute that with the top, say, 1,000 or 10,000 vectors, and then use that as your golden, golden data set. If your model changes, you just rerun that, that computation. And so this is kind of what I found. Um, so in the bottom here, we have recall at 10. So this is really how, how, how close to exact search we're getting. 
you know, one being perfect. And then on, on the y-axis, we have queries per second. Uh, just running on my laptop, nothing else running in a single core, single thread. Um, so to the, up and to the right is better. Um, so basically, I've taken each of these algorithms that I talked about and run a bunch of different parameters through them and then seeing where the performance kind of s the speed accuracy trade-off is. So you want to go up and to the right is better. Um, see, the LSH I was not able to do, uh, to get to do very well. I, I got quite high accuracy, but I was getting very slow performance. Um, the vector thresholding with the tokenization actually does a little better, and it's surprising it works as well as it does, but it doesn't work great. Um, if I encode thing, uh, the vectors with the payloads, the accuracy is really good, but it's still pretty slow. The k-means tree um, so far works better. Now, one limitation to that approach is, um, you know, you probably, you may not want to keep train a k-means tree and keep it up to date with your data, right? So, if if your model changes, you may not want to have to rechange the, the k-means tree and then have to reindex all your documents. So, the orange line um, compares a, a a tree I trained on the sample of our data that was different to what I'm running this test on. And the blue line is, is when I train a tree on the entire set of documents that this is queried against. Um, so obviously it works better if it's fit to the actual vectors, but it still works pretty well if you're just taking a separate sample of data and then uh, running it against that. Okay, I think I'm out of time. <laughs>